We've talked about this team a ton. We just said like, yeah. there's, there's not there's not a good reason for this roster to to not be good, and yet here we are, and people are sick yeah, of I saying was, how uh... good the players are. Like this is just not a good. This is not good enough from the Excelsior this season. Right. Eventually, the that fantastic individual play has to turn into team success at one point, right? Your platinum it chatters. The enigmatic nature of the NYXL has caused unsafe hopium to doomium transitions over and over again. They should be good. They oh, have no. the tools, at least it appears that way, but alas, they've had sparks of greatness most recently against Dallas. What are some reasonable short-term goals for this squad? Is there something that could turn this season into anything but utter disappointment? Oh, one, one. Baby, let's go. <laughs> But they, oh, have good, one. but they have good players. Like, like that's the thing that's so confusing with New York is that <laughs> it's an interesting setup. This, this they, they legitimately stop. have this, they legitimately have good stop. players on the team. They legitimately have good players on the team. There's been a lot of questions about a number of teams in the Overwatch League this season that are at the bottom of these standings. Uh, and these questions are relating to essentially these rosters look like they're built pretty well. Why are they struggling as much as they are? And a lot of the, the teams have very different answers, I think, where you can kind of point to different aspects of these teams themselves. But ultimately, a lot of it comes down to one fundamental issue that a lot of these teams share. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to talk a bit about what I think is the main problem with a number of the teams towards the bottom of the Overwatch League. And I'll be focusing primarily on the four teams currently at the bottom of the standings, the Guangzhou Charge, the New York Excelsior, the Paris Eternal, and the Vancouver Titans. And I'll be highlighting what is working, what isn't working with these rosters, and what I think these teams need to do in order to actually make any type of meaningful improvement for this season, or more than likely going into next season, uh, where we kind of see where these teams really should be focusing their kind of efforts as they look to the future. So a lot of these teams have had essentially the same problem, and the, the problem has manifested itself in different ways throughout the season, but really it's the type of thing where Ultimately, these teams have been breaking one fundamental rule of Overwatch, and that is that they are building teams the fundamentally wrong way. Now, there is an exception to this rule, in my opinion, of these teams, and that is with the Vancouver Titans. Fundamentally, the Vancouver Titans team is not built wrong. They are just a team that suffers very heavily from a talent uh, drought. And I think that the biggest issue this team had is that they did not have a strong coaching staff, um, but I think that with Deepay coming in as a head coach, we've seen some changes there. And so despite the fact that the Vancouver Titans are the worst team in the league right now by record, I think a lot of people in the community and involved in the league would agree that they are not the worst team based on what we've seen from them uh, so far. And we've seen a lot of improvements from them. Of course, they had a very close series against the Washington Justice that, you know, the ending was pretty, pretty bad. But when you look at that match and you look at what happened, we saw a very, very, very clear improvement from the Vancouver Titans. They just had a very, very, very tough tournament cycle uh, this past, um, you know, midseason madness qualifying round, right? But you look at a lot of their next matches, Toronto, Paris, New York, uh, Washington again, Houston. These are winnable games for this Vancouver Titans roster, right? The best team on that list is the Houston Outlaws. And even the Houston Outlaws are a team I don't necessarily think are unbeatable, right? Vancouver could find themselves in a very, very, very good run uh, going into this next tournament cycle. And a big part of that comes down to the fact that their roster is not built fundamentally wrong. These players just didn't have the tools to succeed. That is the biggest problem for most of the teams that you find at the bottom of the rankings year in and year out. Think back on last year's LA Valiant roster, right? We know that there were some players on that team that looked pretty good at times, right? Crystal and Milan ran in particular had some pretty good moments. Wuya had some pretty good moments in that flex support role. But it was really the tank line and the main support player for them, which was Hybe, that really struggled the most last season. And why is that? Well, it's because the team wasn't actually put in a position to succeed, right? The organization was unwilling to spend money on this team. Uh, there's a you know a story about that roster where they were trying to sign a main sport player by the name of Thor uh, to that roster, but he signed uh, a contract with a contenders team, uh, and then the uh, Valiant were unwilling to pay the buyout for him, so they ended up having to sign essentially a person they were bringing in as an assistant coach uh, to be on their roster. They had to put um, a flex DPS on, on off tank and an off tank on main support, and they were basically just losing the whole season because they couldn't swap. 
Uh, they didn't have the resources to succeed. It was a roster that wasn't meant to win games. It was a roster that was meant to show up and play um, and lose, essentially. And unfortunately, we're seeing that again this season with two teams in particular, um, the New York Excelsior and the Paris Eternal. Uh, while the Guangzhou Chargers and the Vancouver Titans have at least done stuff and have actively tried to improve their roster as the season has progressed. And so I want to look at the Titans and the Charge and look at their struggles early in the year and look at how they've tried to address those things and then look at New York and Paris and talk about where they are still continually falling flat and where they are failing to actually make their roster better as the season progresses. Because it's the biggest problem for those two teams is that they haven't done things to actually better their roster. They really have done almost nothing to make their roster anything more than just, you know, a team that will show up uh, two games um, and will maybe go a little bit competitive because they have some good talent, but in other ways, they just simply cannot keep up with other teams. So I've already started talking about Vancouver. Let's talk about Vancouver a little bit. This is a team that has the flexibility where you want it. They have three DPS players, right? They have a Spire, Shockwave, and a Mirror. They can run whatever they need to realistically in uh, that role. You know, if they need double hit scan, they can run Spire and Shockwave. If they need um, a strong flex DPS player, they have Mirror. Obviously, Shockwave can also pick up the Echo. So they have the flexibility in the DPS role that you need to really succeed. You cannot rely on just kind of one or two, you know, compositions to win in the Overwatch League. It simply is not enough. Uh, so this is a team that has done a lot to improve their flexibility, to be flexible in that position. Something that I don't think they did a very good job of last year, um, where their talent just was not as... Uh, kind of up to par as we have from them this season. Support line-wise, they have double flex support and they have a main support. Once again, something that is what you look for uh, in your um, lineup, in your roster. You have to be able to run multiple different types of heroes. Uh, you know, you might need double flex support. You might need a, you know, a Lucio player, whatever it is. They have that with this lineup. And that is where they've, they've, they've been relatively successful. Where they've struggled the most ultimately is a tank line. Uh, False has not played... Uh, at the highest levels so far this season. You would hope that he does a little bit better than what he's actually been able to do, unfortunately, this season. He just hasn't looked um, as good as I think people had expected him to be, considering he came from um, American Tornado. But I don't think that he is necessarily a problem. I think he's more so a symptom of what this team has really struggled to do, um, and that was kind of find some of that talent. But they've started to look better recently when they've started to flex Mirror into the Doomfist role, and they now have multiple different looks they can pull out. Um, and Mirror can also play something like Zarya. He's also good at that hero. He plays pretty much only uh, the Doomfist. But if they can fix some of those tank flexibility issues, or they can round out False's hero pool a little bit more, I, I believe in this coaching staff with, with Deepay as the head coach. And I think that with some good flexibility in that tank role, right, you have False and you potentially also um, have mirror as well to kind of fill into those other roles you could have a pretty competitive roster and we've seen them improving because they have actually been willing to provide the roster with the tools to succeed which for the past two you know past two seasons they weren't right um the the last coaching staff was not very good and that was very very clear um especially this season it was very clear that this coaching staff was not the right move and they had not done anything to show that they were successful in the overwatch league the fact that they even made it to this season is somewhat surprising um, but now they've actually shown a willingness to add things to this roster, build up this roster, fix this roster by actually providing the players with the means to succeed. And I think we're going to see the fruits of that going forward because it looks like the roster is improving because they have the means to do so. You know, shifting over to a team that has also been showing some of those things is the Guangzhou Charge, right? The Guangzhou Charge obviously have had a rough season so far this season. They had a rough season last season, and they're having an equally rough start to this season. But they have not been as static, right? This is a team that I think had multiple problems in their uh, over the course of their kind of lifetime. And one of those things was that they were very, very, very much attached to their their players. Right? They were very much attached to the players that helped build this team, Eileen and Rio. And whether or not you agree with them getting released, right? Them getting released is a sign that this team is more willing to actually make changes where this roster needs it, right? They are willing to build this roster in the way that you should build a roster, right? For pretty much the entirety of the season, they were playing develop and choice Awan. They were not subbing in Eileen, and then, of course, eventually they released him, so that wasn't really an option. Uh, support line-wise was, was Farway and 
uh, unique, and it was fine. It wasn't incredible. They were just decent. They couldn't really run double hit scan with the lineup that they had. They were kind of subbing between Rio and Krong, and they were never really allowing either of those two players to really kind of take control and take the lead. And what we see with the moves that they're making is they're essentially saying, we are building this roster in a way that is reflective of the way that the game is changing, and it is a move that we believe will actually set us up for success. And I think with the way they've changed this roster, they truly have put themselves in a position to succeed. By fully investing in Krong as their only tank, I think we are seeing the trend moving forward is that you have to try to invest in one tank. Much like how in Overwatch 1, you didn't want to sub out your main tank, your off tank, you wanted to have a solid, stable, two-person tank line that you could use throughout the season. We're seeing that again now with one tank, where yes, some teams are more willing to be flexible. Teams like uh, the Shanghai Dragons, the San Francisco Shock, the Dallas Fuel, uh, London Spitfire, some of these good uh, high-end teams are willing to make some of those changes to their tank line. But some teams, and a lot of the really elite teams like the Seoul Dynasty uh, and the LA Gladiators, are choosing not to do that. And we're even seeing the Atlanta Rain moving towards that, just, just playing Hawk. Because what it does is it keeps your team more uh, stable, where the tank line should not be changing. Your tank role should not be changing every map because it changes so much about the way you play and the fundamental structure around how you're playing. And tank is how you initiate, right? That, that is really the, the go button uh, in the Overwatch League and in Overwatch in general. And if you keep changing that out every map, the way that you're playing is changing so much that it's really hard to get your players on the same page, and it causes problems. So the charge choosing to invest fully in Krong shows you that they are moving with the trends that other teams in the league are following. By bringing in Jimmy and Aprita, they are saying, we want to make sure that we have two good hitscan players that are strong level hitscan players, Right? If you even want to kind of look at a team that isn't doing as poorly as these other teams that is having the similar problem, you can look at the Chengdu Hunters, right? The Chengdu Hunters are essentially having to teach um, Jinmu how to play things outside of his comfort role as the season goes on because they don't have the flexibility to compete like they did last season. And it's not like this roster is significantly worse than it was last season. They just don't have the same flexibility they had last season. They could get away a little bit more with... Uh, the hero pools they had last season, because they did have some options to substitute other players in whenever needed, um, but ultimately it really came down to the fact that last year's roster, uh, you know, the meta kind of favored them a bit with the wrecking ball, um, and also there was a, you know, some some Echo was getting a lot of play time, they get it with like Farah and Sombra, stuff like that, so we're not really seeing that anymore, and what we're seeing is that a lack of flexibility can really kill a roster, and so that's why the charge are saying we need more flexibility of their roster. They think Xerneas is a better option in main sport because he's a little bit more flexible and he has more kind of high-level experience. He's, he's been around a long time and he's played at a very high level uh, for a long time. And then you bring in Jimmy and Aprita and that gives you the ability to run double hitscan, which you couldn't do before. You simply couldn't run double hitscan uh, when you had uh, your previous you know lineup with Develop and Eileen and Choice of One because it just wasn't in either of their kind of hero pools, right? And when you go to a map like, say, Circuit Royale, where you need that double hit scan and you kind of need that really good Sigma play, right? Krong comes in, and what is he going to do? He has to watch two, you know, hit scan players, one who's fine but somewhat inconsistent, um, and someone who doesn't play hit scan essentially just lose to the other team who was running really strong double hit scan. In an APAC region where you're running into, you know, double hit scan lineups like Fleta and Lip, like... Uh, Profit and Fitz, or even Stalker and Fitz, potentially, if you wanted to go that route. Uh, Shy and Pineapple. MN3 and Carpe. You know, even Easy Han and Dia is a better double hit scan lineup than what this team could put out. So they're looking and they're saying, we need to follow some of these trends and be able to have that more DPS flexibility that we're seeing other teams around the league doing. And I think this is a much better roster for the Guangzhou Charge. Not only because there's new players that are more refreshed, potentially but also because this roster is well built, okay? It is a very, very clear change to their roster that includes players that we have seen not only perform, but that can add things to this roster that this roster is missing, and that is why it works. Maybe the charge won't be as good as they you know, have been in the past, but if you think this charge team isn't going to be able to compete with teams like the Fusion, like the Spark, 
like the Hunters, like the Valiant as the season progresses, they may even have better results against the Dynasty and the Dragons, right? This is not a bad charge team anymore. This charge team, I think, is better than a number of teams in the Western region right now um, at full potential, right? If this roster works the way that we think it probably will work, this roster will be at a point uh, where I think they'll be able to compete with a lot of those top-level teams because they have made the changes you need to see. They've made the changes you want to see these teams make. Some of these teams, of course, have not been doing that. And some of these teams have been basically breaking every rule that I believe in when it comes to roster building. And the, the biggest offenders of this are the New York Excelsior and the Paris Eternal. So let's start with the Paris Eternal, because they have actively made changes during the season, right, with major roster changes that simply don't work and that I see and I think are just bizarre. If there is one role in the Overwatch League that you need flexibility in, where you need three players, because it is the one role where actively subbing players is a necessity, it is the DPS role. I don't care what team it is. I don't care if you have the best team, right? It is very rare for you to get a situation where you have two DPS players that can play pretty much everything. Not everyone is Profit, not everyone is Fleta. That's just a fact, right? And I think a lot of teams look at teams like the Dragons, like the Dynasty, where they have these two just elite-level DPS players, and they're like, we don't need to ever switch. Look at your San Francisco Shock. Look at your Dallas Fuel, your Atlanta Reigns, your London Spitfires, um... Even teams in the APAC region like the Fusion and the Spark sometimes, right? These are rosters that, if a map calls for it, they'll make those roster changes in the DPS lineup. The Fusion will sub Carpe in if they need a double hitscan because they know that that's the way to go. Uh, and the Fuel are not afraid to switch Gurio in when they need double hitscan. And the Gladiators are not afraid to switch between Potiphon and Ants for when they need double hit scan or when they don't need double hit scan. Because sometimes you simply just need to do that because not every player is a hyperflex player. If you have a hyperflex player, great. Proper is a hyperflex player. And even the Shock still make those substitutions. Even the Dynasty and the Dragons, who I use as the examples of not every team has a Prophet and a Fleta, even they have third DPS players because you might need them. Paris, they decided we don't need that. We just need two DPS players. And I remember when they first announced that they signed Dove, uh, or sorry, Wub, I was like, that's a great move. They signed Wub. Now they have Dove, uh, Wub, Glister, and Naga. They have a, a really good trio now. They can kind of switch between multiple heroes. And then they were like, oh yeah, Naga's, we're, we got rid of Naga now. And I was like, well, that's a terrible decision because now you don't have any DPS flexibility. And then they, you know, got rid of Glister and brought in Dove, and the same problem exists. If you don't have DPS flexibility, you're not setting your team up to succeed because you simply cannot do enough with only two DPS players. You can, you know, if you invest in a team like what they have, where you have a hit scan player and a non-hit scan player, essentially, um, how do you expect to succeed in a double hit scan meta? Like, Wub isn't known for a hit scan play, and Dove is known for a hit scan play. So what happens in a map where you need, like, I don't know, Sojourn and Widowmaker? Well, they can't do anything because they, they, they have to try to do something else. And so they're always going to be running a subpar composition, right? Flexibility is ultimately the thing that set, sets teams up for success, right? Really good teams, teams with the, the most talented players, can overcome, you know, roster limitations... Uh, in terms of flexibility, against your lower level teams, because they're just better teams. But a team like the Dallas Fuel last season, we knew how good they were. They couldn't compete down the stretch with the best of the best, because they just didn't have the flexibility to do so. They didn't have a roster that was built for them to actively be able to compete and be victorious against some of those elite level teams, because they just didn't have the flexibility. And that's a problem we have with this Eternal roster. They're good on the tank flexibility. They don't really put Vestol in very much, which I think is fine, but they have tank flexibility, and their support line is, is solid. I think Dream Drone and Khan can play enough, but they will never be able to meet those heights if they are always playing subpar compositions um, in certain maps, right? 
There are some maps where they simply cannot play the best composition possible. And they're not talented enough to overcome that, uh, where they can't play the right composition. So they're always playing at a disadvantage compositionally. And even if they're the best team at that composition, it's really hard to overcome that when you can't win in certain competition, uh, compositions and on certain map types. And that's the same problem that the New York Excelsior have, right? The New York Excelsior are, in my opinion, one of the most egregiously built rosters in Overwatch League history. And I played clips at the beginning of this video of people talking about, you know, New York should be good, this roster looks good on paper, whatever. The reality is this roster doesn't look good on paper. The names look good on paper. The roster does not. Because this roster literally does not check off a single one of the boxes that you want to check off with a roster, right? They don't have flexibility on any role on this roster. Simply put, zero flexibility. Flora and Yaki, not flexible enough in your DPS line. They can't run double hit scan. They're one of the few teams that runs, you know, the most Echo and the most Genji because they can't run anything else because they don't have the flexibility to run anything else. Tank-wise, Kellen has been improving his flexibility, but he can only do so much when the rest of the roster can't do what you need him to do. And then, don't get me started on the fact that they have three flex supports and no main support. That isn't flexibility, right? That is the very definition of not flexible. They can run Ana, they can run Zenyatta, they can run Batiste, and they look pretty good when they can run Brig, but they can't run Lucio. Well, Lucio was meta for the whole first tournament cycle, so that's a problem. And they just can't run stuff like Mercy, who doesn't get a ton of playtime, to be fair. But when you have heroes that are very, very important, like Lucio, you can't run them. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem. And so you look at this roster and the way that they're built. They fail at every level, and they don't hit at any point what you want this team to hit on as a roster, right? And I know that they've had issues with visas. I know they talked about that in the past, and, and I understand that, right? But that's something you have to consider, right? And even when there's a player like Glister, who is available on the market, who you know has a visa because he was playing with the Eternal, you could literally sign Glister and get him to your team because he has a visa. This team hasn't done it. And it would help their team out a lot because it would give them the ability to run double hit scan. Yeah, he plays a lot of the same stuff Flora plays, but he would at least provide you with another player who has strong hit scan capabilities that would maybe help you compete when you have to play some of those high-level hitscan uh, teams. And it's very clear that we're seeing is there's a number of teams here that simply don't care about their rosters and don't want to put in the uh, energy and the time and the effort to help these players succeed. It's not the players' faults that these teams are bad. It is a simple fact. The teams aren't bad because their players aren't good. Maybe they're not the most talented players in the league, but players in the Overwatch League are in the league for a reason, right? Every team has good players. It's how you enable those players to succeed. And it's very clear that these organizations here towards the bottom don't actually care enough about enabling them or have run into issues with building their roster to the point where they have given up trying to make it work, right? Like I said, I know stuff like these issues come in, and that's why New York last season, you know, for the past couple seasons in the APAC region, because they could bring in players whenever they kind of needed to. But even last season, New York showed an unwillingness to really make changes. They didn't make a change until late in the season to bring Kalios in. And it was very clear and obvious that the problem last season with the New York Excelsior was their tank line. Their tank line was very weak. And I think, you know, last year with, um, I can't remember his name. Uh, this is really embarrassing. But last year, right, their tank line wasn't very good uh, with Yakpung as the main tank. And they didn't make a change there. They eventually brought in Kalios and the roster looked better, but it was too little too late. And when you address those problems early on, a team like New York that has very obvious holes, you know, no off tank, no, you know, DPS flexibility, you know, no second hit scan player, no, you know, main support. Like, it's very obvious what these this team's issues are, but they don't want to fix them. They don't seem to want to put in the money to fix them. Um, maybe that's a general manager issue. Maybe the general manager is on a strict budget. Maybe he just thinks that they don't need to do it. Maybe he thinks that the roster is where it needs to be. Whatever the Whatever the reality is, it's very clear that the reason why these rosters fail is because they have organizations uh, that don't want to enable them to succeed. They don't give them a, a, a strong coaching staff, you know, which is telling the case of Vancouver. Um, and I think we're seeing with the case of New York. I don't think they have a good coaching staff. Um, we're seeing rosters that also simply just don't have the, you know, pieces around them to actually enable players to succeed because they're just always playing at a disadvantage because they're playing players on off rolls, like with New York, uh, or 
they're not investing in the other roles enough that you can't reliably have a player like the reality is like if Gangnam Jin was on a roster that had you know more DPS flexibility where they could actually play the compositions you want from them and more tank flexibility Gangnam Jin could probably get away with being the weakest main support in the league but it doesn't work when the rest of your roster is also at like the bottom of their positions in terms of what you can do and even when you get a meta that works for you or a composition that works for you start a map that works for you if you can't switch into other things when you get countered, you're going to lose every time. Having good players is good, right? And it's important. But it's not going to get you the win if your good players don't have the means to adapt to the, the game around them. And that is what we're seeing with a lot of these teams and why they fail. So good on the Vancouver Titans and good on the Guangzhou Charge for actually making changes to these rosters that I think will enable them for success as we go into the second half of the season. It's very difficult to say that these teams are really going to have a shot at the playoffs and, and be serious contenders, but it's not out for them, and they definitely could do something as we get into kind of the um, summer showdown. But I look at New York, and I look at Paris, and I look at teams and, and organizations that don't want to invest in these players. They don't want to invest in the rosters they have. They don't really care about what they've done. And so these players, it's unfortunate, are not being enabled uh, to succeed. They're not being given the resources that they need to actually function as a proper roster. And so what we're seeing is that players who should be more talented, yes, on paper, um, who are names that we know and that we've seen succeed, aren't being given the means to actually succeed. And that's why they struggle as much as they do. So I know this video is a bit of a kind of rambly, ranty type of video, um, but I figured maybe for those of you who are asking these questions of why these rosters aren't very good, it answers some of those questions, right? These are organizational failings. These are not player failings. They are organizational failings that are setting rosters up to fail, potentially uh, just because it's, you know, organizations don't want to put the money in, which obviously was kind of the thing with London or not London, uh, the LA Valiant last year and, and the Chengdu Hunters this year, and now we're seeing it potentially with Paris and New York. Like Rosters that just don't really care, and they don't, or organizations that don't want to put in the money to help these rosters, uh, whatever the means are, whatever the reason is, that's what we're seeing, and it's very sad and unfortunate. And hopefully uh, in the future we'll actually get more uh, solid and strong um, you know, rosters and we'll get organizations um, and people running these organizations that really do put in that time and effort to make these rosters function the way they should. Because it's it's bad for the fans and it's bad for the league when there's teams like this at the bottom who just uh, don't show the same level of care um, and whatnot for the players that other ones do. And it's really hard then uh, when you do that to make players want to come to your team if, if the entire organization essentially is just saying, we don't really care about you and your success. We just don't want to spend a lot of money. Um, and it's very difficult at that point to say, hey, we want to be here, right? Even a team like the San Francisco Shock have, have had a history where they don't necessarily, you know, sign players to, for the most amount of money. Players go there because they want to win and they want to compete. And they know that that's an organization who cares about them and will give them the resources and enable them to succeed. But these other organizations, like we're seeing with Paris and New York in particular, clearly don't want to do that. And um, it's, it's difficult to see as a fan. It's hard to watch and see these teams just really throw away pretty much all of the goodwill they've ever had with fans um, and with potentially with players, all for the sake of saving some money. So that's really my thoughts on this thing, on this topic. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Uh, I'd love to hear from you on a discussion on this one. Um, I will see you all in about a week, maybe a little more than a week. Hope you all uh, enjoy the end of the uh, Mid-Season Madness. I know I will as much as I can while I'm traveling uh, that's going to be all for me. Hope you're all staying safe and staying healthy. And until next time, bye-bye.